Okay, so hey everybody. Um, I want to start this talk by talking a little bit about this dog I used to have um, as a kid. Her name was Brandy, and I didn't like Brandy, but I respected Brandy. And the reason I respected her was because every time you did anything to displease her, she would go into your bedroom and pee on your bed. And uh, that's, that's, it's kind of a sophisticated thing to do, to be spiteful, right? It seems complex. It, it requires some identification of the person that you want to fuck over, and then how to fuck them over. So I wanted to know a little bit more about how animals can engage in spite and whether or not they actually do. And it turns out that it's a very contentious debate within evolutionary biology. Um, biologists have been talking about this for years, ever since Darwin published On the Origin of Species, whether or not natural selection could select for animals behaving in spiteful ways. It turns out that brandy and domesticated animals, we can't really identify um, whether or not that's intrinsic spitefulness or whether or not it's humans kind of forcing our, our messed up nature on them. But um, they have a lot of theories about how it could actually exist within an evolutionary system. So I like this quotation. Darwin didn't know 99% of what we know, but the 1% he did know was the most important part. So this was a said by a biologist at UC Irvine named Francisco Ayala. And um, it kind of represents how beliefs around evolution have changed since Darwin published on the origins of species. When he first published it, he knew actually like very little about how evolution works. He, he wrote it before he even knew who Gregor Mendel was or anyone really did. Um, they were actually contemporaries. Mendel knew Darwin's work. He had a copy of On the Origin of Species, which he underlined and notated. But Darwin didn't know, and he had no idea how genetic information would be carried along. And he ha also had no idea how um, social behaviors could be carried through natural selection as well. So it took some other scientists to kind of put things together. There's this guy, Ronald Fisher, who actually put genetics together with um, Darwinism and realized that, oh, all of these things are kind of co-occurring. And that brings us to uh, this beefcake. So this is W.D. Hamilton, and he is, yeah, he's, I think he's hot, like really. <laughs> Um, and he, he's even like hotter in essence, so like um, what you can't see here, he, he could have his own odd salon talk by far. Um, he like accidentally blew himself up with a grenade when he was like 10 years old. Um, he was like going through his dad's old arm, armory cache and he blew himself up and like short, permanently shortened his fingers. I don't know. And he would like dive beneath the, the boats. Um, he would go on these like... Ex yeah, ships, there we go. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to get one tonight, but I did. Um, so, <laughs> vessels. So, um, he would, like, try to impress people when he was on his, like, expeditions and, like, dive beneath these boats and say, like, people greatly overestimate the danger of piranhas. Like, he's cool. So, um, when he first... Um, read Fisher's book, Putting Genetics and Natural Selection Together, um, Fisher had this, this theory that everything can be tied into natural selection, and um, Hamilton really wanted to understand whether or not social constructs could too. So he was actually first most interested in um, altruism. So he didn't start thinking about animals being mean. He started talking about animals taking care of one another. And um, altruism in evolutionary biology is like, pretty much a, a proven fact, as much as evolution is. Um, so he, he put together this theory that our, science. yeah, okay, theory. Yeah, that's science, thank you, that's very generous. Um, so he put together this theory that relatedness between the altruist and the recipient um, combined with fitness, bene uh, fitness benefit to the recipient minus fitness cost to the altruist, um, if that's greater than zero, then someone will behave in this way. So essentially, um, Animals are surprisingly good at determining whether or not um, a, another animal is closely related to it, which is surprising because I've seen like a lot of incest in animals, and I just always think, oh, you don't know that that's your son that you're humping. They actually do know that. Um, so, <laughs> some more science for you right there. Um, so, you, they can actually tell um, it's... <laughs> It's called kin discrimination, and they're really good at telling if there's this shared mechanism, if, if their genes are really closely related. And if an animal can tell that, then they will actually act in ways to benefit that other creature. And the, the, this theory is, um, mostly implies that if they can tell 
that another creature is more related to them than the average of the finite set around them, they will act in a way to benefit this other animal. But um, this is where things get controversial. Hamilton thought that um, creatures would also, the reciprocal would be true. They would behave in ways to damage the other group that isn't um, more related to them th than the average. Um, and this is where people started arguing a lot. So Hamilton believed that spite, um, so, so within evolutionary biology, spite is considered something that a creature will do that damages themselves and also damages someone else. And so when Hamilton put forth this theory, he started looking through all these animals, seeing if that ever happened. And the answer is no. There's no example of strong sight, spite in the entirety of the animal kingdom. The, the closest thing that really, that is maybe some bacteria will, um, if they sense another bacteria near them, they'll just explode and just destroy themselves and destroy all the other bacteria. And luckily we don't see that with like mammals. Um, but, you know, it's, it's out there. Um, so, so we're gonna be brought to another beefcake. So this is E.O. Wilson, um, and yeah, um, mm, right? So he, he is a scientist, and he, <laughs> and he, was, he was a little bit um, sweeter with his definition than Hamilton. He said, well, any animal that behaves in a way, to, th that evolution can select for them to behave in a way to damage others will in some way have to be benefiting other animals. So this is the other animals that they're related to. So this is really the controversy within evolutionary biology. Whether or not an animal can be selected for behaving in a way that's just spiteful to other creatures that aren't related to them, or if it has to benefit themselves in some way. Which brings us to our game, spite or not spite. Um, so this is gonna be a very small selection of animals that behave in spiteful ways. You should go through the literature, it is bonkers. So um, we've got this first one. You might know what this, this animal is. This is a lion. Um, and lions, um, at first glance, it looks like they do something really spiteful. And oh, and by the way, all the examples of uh, spitefulness in animals is mostly about baby murder. Um, it all comes down to like killing one another's babies. So just warning there. Um, so this is, this is supposed to be like, I think like a sweet like daddy lion, like kind of gnawing on the sun, but it was the closest thing I could find to a lion eating a baby, um, which I think that you'd all want to see. So yeah, the reality <laughs> is that lions, um, when a lion, a male lion is two years old, he pretty much gets kicked out of the pack, which bears some like interesting um, realizations on the Lion King. Like Simba wouldn't, it was, he would, he would have been kicked out anyway if, if Mufasa had survived. Um, so, so all two-year-old male lions end up getting kind of pushed out, and they wander the, pro the plains until they get strong enough to try to um, defeat another male lion and kick them out of his pride. And when that happens, the thing that the lion, this new male lion does, is he kills all of the babies just immediately. And he doesn't even eat them. Like, that's like, have some decorum. If you're going to kill a baby, at least eat it. And... <laughs> He doesn't. So at first, this was thought to be like a really spiteful. <laughs> Thank you. That's the, that's going to be the new thing we shout out. A modest proposal. Um, but um, he. So you. So he doesn't eat the the baby. So at first, everybody thought, oh, this is spiteful. Like it's in some way, like it's kind of dangerous because maybe the the females would swan at him. But no, it turns out that. Female lions get super horny when their babies get killed. So it puts them into estrus and it makes them really fertile. So when, yeah, so when he kills him, it just makes it so that he can have his own baby. So it's actually beneficial to his own family line. Okay, so how about this guy? This is one spiteful motherfucker. We can all agree <laughs> that seagulls are spiteful animals, only, only less spiteful than the, the goose, the, that most evil of animals. <laughs> yeah, boo to geese, right? Not boo to me calling out geese, I hope. Um, so they engage in a lot of spiteful looking behaviors, including the, the scientific name for when they steal your french fries is kleptoparasitism. <laughs> 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 um, but they, they found that um, seagulls, especially on the Farallon Islands, um, they will bully 
chicks more than they'll bully other competing animals that could actually steal from one another. Um, so, what, so scientists kind of engaged, uh, started looking into that. Like, okay, they're kind of putting themselves at risk by throwing the, the chicks out of the nests, and it doesn't seem like it would provide any benefit to them. But it turns out that it only happens when um, the breeding grounds are limited. So, okay, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, and then there comes this, this critter. I, uh, I've been practicing, but I don't know if I can pronounce this guy's name. The Capitosoma floridanum. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's some science for you. Um, so this is a type of wasp, and it's really, this wasp has some messed up shit, guys. Um, so they, they can only produce eggs within a larger egg of a type of moth. And all of these wasps put their eggs in the same moth egg, and they've actually um, evolved so that all of their eggs, um, when they um, implant an egg, it separates into two types of eggs that just keep on kind of cloning, and half of the eggs are actually going to turn into wasps, and then half of the eggs only act to battle the other wasp eggs in this moth egg. So, yeah, it is bonkers. And um, science, so this is probably the closest thing that we've found to real Hamiltonian spite. Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of spiteful, but then, you know, a lot of people kind of argue, well, it's because there's limited resources that they're fighting over. It could actually be perceived as being beneficial to kin. So as I'm going through all these articles, I read so many articles about animals doing weird shit. Um, <laughs> What came to me is that as I'm going through article after article, it's constantly like scientists refuting one another. And I realized the true spiteful behavior <laughs> was in the humans. And um, I really delighted in that realization. So I'd like to, to raise our glasses to the human propensity for spite because it's truly what separates us from the beast. Uh, 